Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for advisors considering the independent space. Today's episode is how the freedom to communicate during a crisis translated to 4x growth for this ex-Morgan Stanley team, a conversation with David Bonson, founder and managing partner of the Bonson Group. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, please feel free to share it widely. Everyone is searching for a secret sauce. That is, the best practices to deploy during this crisis that will ensure success now and into the future. And as we've had the honor to share many stories from independent advisors in this series, we recognize a common thread amongst them. That is, how valuable it is to be able to communicate with their clients freely and creatively. Something that's become even more important during these unsettled times. My guest in today's episode, David Bonson, is the quintessential example of how to weather a storm and thrive. He practically wrote the playbook in 2008 for how to grow a business during a financial crisis and finds himself referring back to those same practices today. David and his Newport Beach, California-based team left Morgan Stanley in 2015 in search of greater freedom and a less conflicted environment. Now, five years later, he's grown exponentially from managing $600 million in assets when he left to over $2 billion today, and he added a New York City office as well. David is a contributor to the National Review and Forbes and a regular guest on CNBC, Bloomberg, and Fox Business. David also publishes his own blog and podcast series. He will share with us his firsthand telling of the breakaway journey, the pushes and pulls that started them on their way, and ultimately what they've found on the other side. It's a story he surely shares best, so let's get to it. David, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Mindy. Okay, let's jump right to it. I want to start at the top, if it's okay with you. Tell us a bit about your background. Well, I uh, entered the financial services industry as a trainee at Payne Weber the year that they sold to UBS, what feels like many moons ago, but it really wasn't all that long ago. I had previously run a business doing business management for musical artists and been pretty successful there and had sold the company and was ready to enter the career of my dreams, which was delving into investments and investment management. So I spent six years as a sole operator at UBS and eventually got recruited away to Morgan Stanley. And that was where my uh, book really kind of exploded through the financial crisis, just took advantage of the very difficult period we were all going through to really reach out to those who were affected and and lay out a kind of different value proposition than they were used to. And, and it was quite successful. So I spent the bulk of the first 15 years of my career at UBS and Morgan Stanley, had a wonderful time there. And now uh, here we are. So that was my background in financial services. And so you said you reached out to these sort of underserved folks in the financial crisis to offer them a different value proposition. Can you tell us what that was? 
I can. It was um, very similar to kind of when I was first starting off. And I, I talk about this a lot with people that I did not know how difficult what I was doing was supposed to be, how much the odds were were stacked against you, how, how low the success rate was of trainees and so forth. And, and if I had known, I honestly don't think I would have been successful. I imagine natural human psychology would have kicked in and the intimidation factor would have become daunting, but ignorance was bliss. And so in the aftermath of the dot-com blow up, I just sort of naively was working away, finding unbelievable amounts of dissatisfied people and turning it into opportunities as I was growing my business. So when the financial crisis happened, um, as opposed to me having zero dollars under management coming out of dot com, I had a little over a hundred million entering the financial crisis. Had been kind of a first quintile guy throughout my early years, so I had a book, I had clients to take care of, but I also knew that the opportunities in prospecting for new business in bad markets is just significantly better than it is in good markets. So I went about communicating heavily. Um, It doesn't seem very profound, but I think it is incredibly rare. Rather than sort of avoid interaction about the markets, I took advantage of every opportunity I could to talk about what was going on and why and what needed to be done, being a listener and delving into people's specific situations, but doing it with scale, doing it with as many people as I possibly could. And so it required a lot of energy, it required a lot of work, and, and yet the fruit it bore was, was tremendous. Yeah, it sounds that way. So you left Morgan Stanley in 2015 after what sounds like about nine years. And that was a time when independence wasn't nearly as mainstream as it is today. I'll circle back to that in a bit. But what did your business look like at the time? You said your business exploded during the financial crisis. So how, mu- how many were on your team? How much in assets were you managing? What did it look like? So by the time that I was beginning to explore independence and and doing pretty serious due diligence around going that route, I had just turned 40 years of age in the middle of 2014, and I was at that point now running about $600 in assets. I had a couple admin on the team. I had hired a planner onto the team. I had someone doing portfolio reviews and a junior advisor. So it was all support roles. It was a totally vertical team, but I was the only rainmaker. And again, at 600 million and about 4 million of revenue, we were, you know, a a top team in our branch and and region and in the firm. I had been a chairman's club producer at Morgan for years. So I was really happy with the state of our business. We were continuing to grow and very pleased with our net new asset growth. By the time we actually left, there were eight people on the team total made up of a combination of, you know, junior type advisors, each with a sort of specialized role and then different admin functions. So it was a risky move in the sense that there wasn't a lot broken. You know, we had a good rhythm, but we knew it was time for something different if we wanted to go to the next level. I'd love to hear more, David, about that, but also recognize you find yourself again in the midst of a financial crisis. So let's focus on that a bit and discuss how you're navigating these unprecedented times. So I guess first and foremost, how busy are you and how do you spend most of your time these days? Oh, it's it's incredibly busy in, in the context of everything that is happening right now in the world. We, very similar to the 2008 financial crisis, have made the decision that these are the times the clients pay us for. So we are doing more in terms of client outreach, client touch, content creation, providing information and perspective. We're also more engaged as active portfolio managers. So the workload around both client emotional care and portfolio management is heavier than ever. And it's the same approach we took in the financial crisis. And do I believe it will result in in business growth in the future? It probably will. It certainly did out of the financial crisis. But I assure you, that's not what's on my mind right now. What's on my mind is pulling our clients through this moment, which is what our solemn duty is. 
Mm, I love that. It's interesting you say that because I think what we're all grappling with is this is not a time to sell, but a time to add value and add value solely and exclusively. And if business growth happens to result out of it, great, but it's it shouldn't be the primary goal. But I think one of the things that this does is really test people's sense of faith, the ability to trust. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, but the ability to trust in what you can't see, to trust in the fact that what you are doing today are the right set of actions that will help to impact a better future. So with that in mind, let me ask you a question. Other than over-communicating, what other best practices did you employ in the 2008 crisis that you are finding relevant today? Well, one of the things was the um, just sort of day-to-day practical application of what that client touch means. Having that kind of intentionality and in talking to people, you know, it could be as simple as you're used to talking to certain clients on the phone, but you're multitasking sometimes when you do it. And in moments like this, you don't multitask when you're talking to them. You look away from your monitor, you look away from your TV, you look away from your text, and you just get in the moment of, of focusing on the client conversation. That alone, I think, adds to the depth, the empathy, and the relational quality of what you're attempting to do. But even beyond some of those things that might, I guess you could categorize as more touchy-feely, I also think it is a really important time to revisit with clients the philosophy that you bring to their investment management, explaining to them why you have the cash reserves you have, why you have the asset allocation you have. For us as dividend growth investors, it's been a really important opportunity to focus on why cash flow generation needs to be maintained even when portfolio values are declining. And so it's a reaffirmation of principles that you hold dear all the time. I think this is true of everything, Mindy, not just the financial advisor's uh, ethos, but a crisis is not supposed to be a time to formulate your philosophy. It's supposed to be a time to live out your philosophy. I love that. And I think that that's incredibly valid. So what are you hearing from your clients? How often do you communicate with them and what sort of responses are you getting from them? Well, more or less, we're in communication every single day. We're putting out market commentary on a daily basis. We're putting out health updates and various data related to the entire pandemic. Uh, We're doing more podcasts, more videos, just basically that ongoing touch that is all written by us. That is all our perspective, not trying to just circulate someone else's material that I think loses accountability, but also loses integrity. And authenticity. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a lot of that. But then even apart from the scalable touch points through video and podcast and written, we also are just on the phone more talking to clients. It's interesting because of the nature of a sort of quarantine environment, it forces you to be on the phone more, some even with Skype and FaceTime and Zoom and things like that. Whereas in 2008, there was an awful lot more face-to-face meetings going on. And that ability with both our New York and California office temporarily shut down and 26 employees working in 26 different locations, it actually, in an ironic way, has benefited that ability Because as you know, a meeting is going to take extra time for setup and takedown and the niceties where a phone call enables you to kind of get right into things, talk what you need to do, and then move on to the next call. And so we are finding ourselves facilitating a greater volume of client communications. Interesting. And in terms of client responses, I've been hearing from a lot of the advisors I'm talking with that early on, the, you know, the first week this began, clients were really, really scared, panicked in a lot of cases. But as time goes by, it's not necessarily that people are less scared, but I think everyone sort of has a sense of acceptance that we're going to be in this for a while. This is not going away anytime soon, that this too shall pass, that we just have to trust that when the virus clears, God willing, sooner rather than later, that the economy will clear to some degree as well. But what are you hearing from your clients and how have their responses changed throughout this crisis? 
Well, it's a mixed bag. There are certain clients that I think um, were with us through the financial crisis that have sort of reiterated the things they learned at that time. There are obviously a lot of investors. If you look at kind of the baby boomer demographic, they've lived through four market swoons of drama in their adult life from 87 to 9-11 to the crisis to this. And so there's a little bit more endurance than maybe a lot of investors had. We are definitely finding our younger clients are having more problem with this. Many of them have never seen a market decline. And I believe the number is 57 times since the financial crisis that we dropped from 2 to 10%. And 57 out of 57 times proved to be a buy the dip moment. And this did not. This became something much more significant and much more violent. And so it's a need, it's providing a need to provide historical context and reinforce evergreen behavioral principles. I love that. David, I know you're a media personality and typically do a lot of creative communicating with clients and prospects during more normal times. So what kind of things are you doing now other than phone conversations relative to marketing and communication? And the word marketing sort of, I don't mean that in a salesy standpoint. I just mean in terms of a client and prospect communication standpoint. Yeah, like one example, which happened to be designed by my wife, who serves as our director of of client experience, was just doing little two-minute videos that seek to answer more high-level questions about what should I be doing now? What level of cash should I have on hand? How do I manage the risk level with our desire to repair the portfolio? And those shorter videos that we then use social media to distribute and that sit on the home page of our website, Carousel, they've been very, very well received. So those things, I think, are really universal in their audience, whereas my Dividend Cafe communications those can run eight, nine, 10 pages, and I'm not going to stop doing them, and I'm not going to stop doing them that long. Yet, obviously, they're going to be intended for a little bit more cerebral of an audience. And so I think it's provided us the ability to be creative in how we generate content for everybody, all comers. And so relative to that creativity, you mentioned to me just before we started this recording that we are recording today on April 2nd, 2020, which happens to be the to the day five-year anniversary from the time you and your team broke from Morgan Stanley. So my question is, what are the pros and cons of being a business owner now in this crisis relative to, or versus being an employee of Morgan Stanley or any major firm? Yeah, it really is a special day for us and my team. I was sending an email out at uh, 3.30 this morning to my whole team of a happy anniversary and then actually even got to send texts to some of the old Hightower folks who were part of that move five years ago and and our current uh, friends that are at Hightower and our current friends that are custodians. You know, it, I look back on it and this five years, all the things we're doing right now in the midst of this crisis, Mindy, I couldn't have been doing if I were still in the big wirehouse bureaucratic culture, how could I get things out to clients sometimes twice a day, sometimes in four different mediums, podcast, video, commentary, website, when it took three days to get approvals or five days or whatnot. Um, the idea of sending out firm white labeled content, I think is very ineffective, as you said earlier, is inauthentic. So this independence that we commemorate today is really a tool that we're using to our advantage in the present environment. And I also have to say, and I don't want to pile on here to my friends in the wirehouse, but who would have ever guessed that 26 people would get forced to work remotely? I promise you, if you're forced to work remotely, you want independent technology, not wirehouse technology. So much more open architecture, so much more web-driven, cloud-driven, remote-friendly, and we are really impressed at the technology apparatus, which largely, by the way, we pay Hightower for a lot of that work, but we've been very impressed at how our cloud-driven and web-driven apparatus has held up with, I mean, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars of trading 
not to mention client account work, database, performance. You, you can think of all the gamut of things that have been required in this. We're really grateful for independent technology in addition to all the other things I highlighted. And how about, are you missing anything? So where do you get, from where do you get the input, support, thought leadership, and research you need to weather this storm or any other? Well, we are vigorous research readers uh, through some of the arrangements institutionally that have been provided to those that use Hightower. We have macro research firms that we subscribe to that I read uh, hundreds of pages a day. I mean that very literally. I have other research that I utilize outside of the Hightower community, buy side, sell side, macro. You know, right now there's a significant, we've talked already about the nexus of politics and markets in my business. And there is very few moments that right now highlight the need for understanding Washington, D.C. and its connectivity to Wall Street. And so I'm relying very heavily on resources I have inside the Beltway. So this is definitely a time for those who thirst for content and research and information to tap those sources. And that's what we're doing. But are you lacking anything? In other words, was there anything that Morgan Stanley or any big firm could or would have provided you that you're not able to get now, that you feel you're missing now? The answer is no. And that would just be the kind of short, blunt way to answer the question. But to elaborate, um, it's a profound no. By the way, the research I got at Morgan Stanley, I still get. Okay, we, we have access to all of the sell side research or the whole street. It's just that I have more than it. I have Morgan Stanley and I have Goldman, Merrill, JP, Wells, Jeffries, Raymond James. There's a lot of great sell side research out there. We get all of it. And then on top of it, we're able to go to more boutique and I would say more intellectual research that hedge funds and other institutions will subscribe to that are really, really vital. And candidly, some of the research is stuff that now I couldn't survive without. I don't want them to hear this, but if my cost went up 10 times, I would pay it. That's how much I rely on some of the partners at GovCal and, and Strategius and so forth. These are really phenomenal macro research providers available to the independent community. Interesting. One final question about the crisis, because I don't want to belabor it, although your answers are incredibly insightful and helpful. I guess the question is this, that do you feel that in some way, the big brand name firm would be more impressive to a prospect. So your clients are your clients, they know you. But do you feel like going forward, prospects, would-be clients, will be more moved by an individual advisor's capabilities or more moved by the name of the firm on the door? It is different now versus the financial crisis where the name on the door was often a liability right? There was such a, a sort of societal pushback against the roles that some of the big firms played in the financial crisis itself, the debt and leverage and mortgage contribution that they had into that whole global credit crisis. Now, obviously, no one is blaming any of the financial firms for what's happening with coronavirus, but I don't believe that anybody is thinking, wow, we really benefit from the stability of a brand name. What I hear over and over again is we are so grateful for your communication. We're grateful for the speed at which you're able to talk to us and the kind of novelty and authenticity of the messaging that you're giving. And those are things that would not exist at some of the big firms. And can I say another thing too, Mindy? And this is really touching to me. I'm getting at least one email a day and LinkedIn communications from people at the big firms, advisors, other wirehouses, thanking me for the content we're creating. So mm. it's not just clients and prospects, but I think advisor members of other firms are benefiting from the ability to authentically and quickly create fresh and useful perspective. That is amazing. Now I'd like to take a step back to your leap to independence. What was it that drove you and what were the pushes and pulls toward it? 
Well, I, in a lot of ways, I think that the wirehouses themselves helped fertilize the appetite for independence because they became, for good reason, very focused on teaming. And you would go to a, a chairman's club event, you'd be at some of the different company-wide events and symposiums and things, and there were breakouts and special speakers and and, and understandable uh, strategic significance put on this notion of teaming. So you would taste a little bit what the idea of maybe having a brand was supposed to be and having a division of labor and being able to hire and fire people and create more of a business-like feel. It was just an enough to kind of whet your appetite. But then, of course, you figured out, well, you can't really do it. You can't really title people what you want to title them. And and you're subject to the company's HR, you know, needs and requirements. The budgeting levels were highly regulated. It was not as entrepreneurial as it needed to be, yet you kind of at that point had a little bit of an itch for being more entrepreneurial. And so that was really what started pushing me into exploring it more was, do I actually want to run a business? And if I do, do I want to kind of fake it in a team structure at a wirehouse or do I want to really actually go run a business? And obviously I opted for the latter. Yeah. So for perspective, let's jump forward to what the business looks like today. How much in assets does the firm manage and how many partners are and support staff are there today? So we are at 25 people that are actual employees of the organization. That includes the, our partners. And we are at $2,250,000,000. So $2.25 billion in assets that we are actually under management, real, you know, hard custodied assets. Amazing. And so, yeah, it's, it's really been an amazing growth journey over these last five years. It does represent a quadrupling of the assets assets that we moved out of Morgan Stanley at the time that we left. And then as far as the personnel, we were at eight and now we're at 25. So obviously a little bit more than tripling of our headcount as well. Which is extraordinary. So what do you think? It begs the question. And I want to get back to what version of independence and who you chose as your partners and all of that. But we must ask, I must ask you, what accounts for that almost 4x growth in assets? And is it growth that you think you could have achieved under a Morgan Stanley umbrella? Well, so that last question I'll answer first because that's the easiest part. And the answer is unequivocally no. I think we would have kept growing because I definitely have a growth mentality. I wake up every day looking to grow, looking to be better than I was the day before. We have aspirational and ambitious people on our team. So we would have continued to grow, but there is absolutely no way that we could have experienced this kind of growth had we not gone the independent route. I believed that was the case, Mindy, before we left, that we were going to open up the doors to an entirely different universe of growth. But I never could have dreamed that I would be so right. I I underestimated what that meant. Well, better that way than the other way around, for sure. (laughs) That's very true. (laughs) But I think of all the questions that I anticipated you may ask in our time together today, this is the one that I'm most excited to answer about why I believe that was true for us, what it was in particular. Because I listen to guests on on your podcast all the time, and I talk to colleagues that have also gone independent. I've never talked to one ever that didn't share appreciation for what they did, a fondness, a gratitude for having made that leap. I've never talked to one who hasn't grown in some degree, but I think that there's probably different reasons for each person's ability to grow in an entrepreneurial, independent environment. And I really do believe that ours is somewhat unique. What is shared in common, the common ground that all folks who leave a wirehouse environment to go independent have is itself the freedom. 
and where that freedom leads to business growth could be different things for different people. Having, you know, a better margin in your business to spend more on marketing. That could be an explanation for some people. Just simply getting away from a conflicted environment, uh, having certain prospects that were never comfortable with the, your brand name but that now become so. All of those things make sense to me. They're all legitimate. But in our case, content as a service was always at the core of what we were doing. And there is nothing that was more constricted at a wirehouse than your ability to create content. And there's nothing that we have more freedom in now than our ability to create content. So we were driving interest in the communities that we serve. We were generating awareness of who we are and our message via the content we were creating. We were trying to demonstrate competence and likability in our circles of influence. And we did that at the wirehouse. But once we went independent, all of a sudden we could do it exponentially. And that was, to me, the primary driver of our growth is the enhanced freedom to be a messenger of original and thoughtful content. I believe it's been something that I never could have appreciated how significant the independent world facilitated. So I'm fascinated by that, partly because that's exactly my philosophy in growing my business. I started sort of writing, not because I had I was some marketing genius, but because I liked writing and had something to say. The fact that people started reading it or listening to a podcast was sort of cherry on top. So I'm fascinated by it. And I couldn't imagine living in a world where I was limited or restricted from sharing my thoughts because some corporate overlord said I couldn't. So I get that totally. What are the forms, the the platforms that you use to distribute to be the messenger of thoughtful content? Well, of course, we are big users of, of social media, but I don't think that social media is necessarily the primary platform. It more tends to be distribution to that, that underlying platform, very web-driven, very white paper-driven. It's a combination, though. We kind of take a multifaceted approach. I've written three books since I went independent. I've written every word of every book myself. I've written every word of every blog post, Facebook post, weekly market commentary, podcast, everything that we do is fresh and original content. I have partners that have their own creative properties. My partner, Kimberly Davis, runs something called The Fiscal Feminist. It all stems from her originally. And I don't have anything negative to say about those who choose to use ghostwritten content or to kind of, you know, white label other thought leadership. I can understand why some may choose to go that route, but it isn't us and we're never going to do it. There's something about the authenticity and the uh, way it kind of stirs me and excites me that is just very important. And at the end of the day, that accountability, what I'm saying has to be my own message. It's not just in my voice, but it has to be my message. And then I have to own what it is I said for good or for bad. And so we have an authentic approach to it. And then the mediums now have all just um, multiplied. It's You can send out email blasts, but you can also post things to websites and use social media and then uh, television media, more conventional has been a huge thing for us. I'm a pretty regular contributor on Fox Business, Fox News, Bloomberg, CNBC. You combine those things with our web presence and with social, with book writing, it all makes for a pretty robust potpourri of content. Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations on all of that. I think that the word authentic is really key to it. I too write all of my own content and I do it. It's a labor of love. It's my truth. I stand by it for better or for worse, but it is the authenticity that I think people respond to. So kudos to you. Let me back up for a second. You talked about leaving Morgan in 2015, and it sounds like it was a decision less because you were in pain, less because it wasn't working, and more because opportunistically you wanted to be able to do things that you couldn't do under the Morgan umbrella or in that environment. And it doesn't sound like it was Morgan-specific, it was model-specific. But when you left Morgan, I know you chose to join Hightower. What were some of the drivers, if there were any, to leave Morgan? And then why Hightower? 
Well, at the time that I was beginning to think about whether or not I was going to spend the rest of my career at Morgan or not, I'd become a managing director at the firm. I'd been in Chairman's Club for years, and I was pretty close with with the folks that were in senior management. I quickly learned that it's hard to stay close with folks in senior management because they turn over so much. But I had an opportunity to have dinner with Greg Fleming, who is now, of course, the head at Rockefeller, but at the time was the president of Morgan's Wealth Management Unit. And I was in New York and we had a dinner together and I asked him, well, obviously without giving him any inclination of what I was thinking about, but I asked him what he thought was the underlying key value proposition, the single differentiator that he would use to explain to someone why they ought to be a Morgan versus some of the other firms, recognizing that, of course, there were great big firms out there that had an awful lot of capabilities. They had brand names. They had technology. They had a vast array of capabilities from the Merrills and UBSs and and Morgans of the world. What would make in his mind, Morgan, that differentiator. And he said their intellectual capital. Back from dinner that night, it was just he and I together at dinner and and my hotel was, you know, a little ways away. And I was just literally obsessed with what he said in my mind as I walked back to my hotel, because all I could think of was a, it was a great answer. It was an honest answer. I think he meant it. It was, it reached something that needed to be said that you would like to think your firm had your intellectual capabilities and in, in what is meant to be a very cerebral industry. There needs to be high quality competence and thought leadership coming from those that are stewarding client capital. And yet it just haunted me how little it appealed to me, how I didn't use their intellectual capital. I didn't find their research particularly vital to my business. And so I was here with the president of the company telling me what the key differentiator was for the firm I was ready to spend the rest of my career at and had a significant amount of my net worth tied up into. And all I could think about was that their best answer didn't really have any cachet with me. And, and that kind of put me over the edge to take that leap to go forward and begin really vigorously exploring what independence would look like. Interesting. And I know you have a unique relationship or a somewhat unique relationship with Hightower. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can. So we we have a very close relationship in the sense that it's very friendly. I have a lot of respect for their senior management team now, the the new folks that uh, have been brought in since their latest investors came in, I think are, are really high caliber people. But in our case, we have a company called the Bonson Group, and Hightower does not own any part of our company. We run our own finances, our own accounts payable. We have a, our controller here on site, it's employee of our company, and we don't brand with Hightower. The name Hightower is not at all part of our public persona. And there are plenty of other teams in the Hightower community that brand away as well. And so I think that Hightower has done a very good job responding to the marketplace to say, we're not trying to create a mini wirehouse. We want to be a facilitator for independent minded advisors. And if there are some who want to have a sort of collective branding, we'll facilitate that. But for those that maybe don't see a benefit in it, we'll facilitate that as well. So what's unique in our case is there are not a lot of teams in the community that are both branded away and separate organizationally. And yet we have a platform relationship with them where we pay them for services, uh, in our case, primarily related to the compliance and supervision side and the operations and technology. And we think that those are more or less the only areas that I don't have any desire to do myself whatsoever, that I'm least capable of doing, least resourced in doing, and therefore it represents the lowest thing to hire someone like them that has scale and can go about doing it uh, with ongoing subject matter expertise and progress and and regular development. You know, I could go hire someone, get all suited up uh, technologically, but then everything changes two months later, where with Hightower, they're heavily incented to stay on top of those technological changes. I have no interest in staying on top of that type of stuff at all. So what you have your own ADV is what you're saying? 
No, we are under their corporate ADV, but where it's separate. So all the teams Folio Hightower are under their corporate ADV, but we are our own separate business entity. Uh, we're not under their HR, under their employee benefits, under their payroll. All of my people work for me, not for Hightower. Mm-hmm. So probably the fastest growing segment of the industry landscape has been the ecosystem to support the breakaway advisor. And so this notion of service provider or platform firm that is essentially is the role Hightower is playing for you. Firms that do the middle office and back office work and facilitate the transition and really manage the part, the minutia of running the business that a lot of business owners don't want to deal with, but don't own any equity. And today there are many options. It's a crowded and competitive field. What other options did you consider besides Hightower? So at the time, I did look at Raymond James um, for a bit. I, I looked at Finet under the Wells umbrella. But then even apart from some of those bigger brand name kind of resources, the, the area that you're referring to where it was a different inning in the game. They were not in the first innings, the Focuses, Dynasties, and High Towers. By 2014, they had moved the ball a bit, but they were nowhere near where they are now as organizations. And so most of my due diligence centered around those types of firms and outfits that all had different structures and all had different value propositions. And I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I had to enter it to educationally absorb kind of the lay of the land. And then, of course, decipher what I thought was going to be the best fit for my business. There were a couple other smaller players at the time too. I don't think any of them are even still around anymore, the, at least in this capacity. I, you remember Canner Fitzgerald was mm-hmm. experimenting with this a bit. And there was a little firm out here in the West Coast called Integrated that we met with. So that we did a lot of due diligence and I'm a pretty OCD guy, but certainly the big finalists were what are probably the big finalists for a lot of people. And it was Dynasty Focus and and Hightower. And it was a painful decision because there, frankly, were just totally different pros and cons for each one of them. In the final analysis, most advisors say to us, boy, if I could mush together the best of choice A and the best of choice B and put them together into one, that's the firm I'd go to. Unfortunately, you can't do that. So in the final analysis, it's really about determining what is most important to you and then choosing the right firm based upon what's most important to you and knowing you're going to need to be flexible to some degree. There will be some give ups. Absolutely. And and you're so right. I actually, I think Mindy said that exact line that if I could just get a fourth option that took this and this from option one and this and this from option two and down the list that I would end up with that perfect kind of Mr. Potato Head strategic <laughs> partner, you know, for us to do this. But I am very glad that we made the decision we made. I had to make the decision based on what I knew at the time, what I understood at the time. And of course, you learn things as you go. And, you know, I've said several times, are there people out there that don't use a strategic partner? They don't need their capital. They don't need their transition support. They don't need technology support or other services. They can just go put a shingle up and kind of make the move. And I think that there are. And yet, in my case, whether or not that could have proven to be a really good decision for us, it doesn't matter because I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't ready to make the leap without a partner, without someone that could provide that assistance. And so from day one, we were not looking as to whether or not we were going to have a partner. We were looking who was that partner going to be. Well, you were self-aware. You knew what you want, how you wanted to live your life and what core competencies were yours and what wasn't. And you leveraged what was available for the parts that you didn't want to get involved with. That's what it is to be a smart business owner. So I think you did the right thing. Um, I'd love to pivot, David, to ask you or to sort of raise, we obviously are in traffic with so many prospective breakaway advisors. So these are advisors that like you sit at or sitting at any one of the wirehouse or major regional firms and looking at independence and see that certain aspects of it is very appealing. The most of which is to have more freedom and control, but there are many things that they worry about as well. Well, And from where I sit, some of them are valid and some of them are probably more based upon myths than anything else. But I'd love to run them by you if I can. Sure. 
Okay, first one. Many believe that they need to be a serial entrepreneur. I joke, they need to be Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates in order to make the leap. Would you characterize yourself as such an entrepreneur? And what role did the entrepreneurial mindset play in your decision to go independent? Well, no, I wouldn't classify myself that way. But I think that as I have delved into it, I have appreciated more and more the responsibilities of being an entrepreneur and, of course, the upside and the privileges. I'm grateful that I'm in an entrepreneurial position now, but I do not think it is some sort of DNA or higher calling that you have to have to make the leap. I think it has to start. And I know this sounds somewhat self-righteous, but I just, I believe it so much. I don't care. I have to say it. It starts with whether or not you honestly believe you're servicing your clients the best way you can in your present situation. And I believe for a lot of people, they likely know that they could be servicing their clients in a far better way um, in a more independent fiduciary environment. And so once you start with that as the primary driver, there's all kinds of things you can focus on as other advantages, the freedom that is important to an entrepreneur, the, you know, I cannot now even comprehend having to get permission for different things that I used to have to get permission for all the time. It is an incredible blessing that I can just do the things I need to do to run my business, to run my team, and most importantly, to service our clients. So yeah, I don't agree that someone has to have this sort of entrepreneurial dream inside of them, but I do think that they will end up appreciating the freedom aspect that comes with it. Yeah, I happen to think you're 100% right. And I say to the advisors we counsel all the time that it's less about being Bill Gates and much more about do you believe that you as a fiduciary are truly best able to service your clients where you are? And what happens often is people don't know, you said it yourself, you don't know what you don't know. So very often until someone goes out and explores what it means to be independent, whether it be listening to an episode like this where they're hearing from somebody the horse's mouth, or whether it be going out and actually doing the exploration and talking with custodians or the like themselves, very often they think they're perfectly well situated and they're able to do the best they can. The problem and the conflict comes in for many of these folks when they begin to go out and explore. And once they see that there could be a better way, you can't unsee it. Once you see it and you know that there's a better way, that there's a less conflicted way. And it doesn't mean that that's true for everyone, certainly not. But many advisors that look at independence can't unsee it. They can't unknow the fact that there is, in fact, a better way that a client can be better served, better communicated with, better priced, have more freedom, have better investment options, et cetera, elsewhere. And once that happens, it's hard then to really stay complacent as an employee. Would you agree with that? Oh, I agree completely. And I think that once you get a taste of that as it pertains to clients, you're also getting a taste of it as it pertains to two other stakeholders that are very important. That is prospects. And then that is your own team. And I would focus on that third aspect because I met a lot of senior wirehouse guys that cared about their CSA, their administrative support. They cared about their juniors or their planners or their analyst or whoever they kind of had around them. But see, now I have the ability to affect bonuses, to affect ownership structure via equity and partnership, to totally customize an incredibly generous benefits plan, profit sharing plan, you know, parking benefits. We have a very lovely office in New York City, uh, which was another thing I could never do at Morgan Stanley, by the way, open up a second office. And eventually, I think third and fourth offices, you get sort of a an expansion capability in the independent environment, as opposed to just being a, a wirehouse employee. But once I got a taste of how I could really better care for my team and their careers, I could never look back on that either, where you always sort of lived with the reality at a wirehouse that they did not work for you. They were a W-2 employee of a firm and they could be reassigned. They could be shared with someone else. They reported to someone different than you. 
And I think that that is a big difference. So when you look at the benefits independence allows in obviously how you service clients and how you care and manage your team, but then also with prospects, the things that you can go about doing, the freedom and flexibility you have. And I talked a lot about how content and thought leadership is a huge driver for us, but just the overall environment that is not so tight around, is there someone else in the firm we might be talking? to the person? Are you competing with your own colleague? You just have this total open architecture to communicate in your community as you please. And I think those in in all three categories, I could never imagine going back. And how about the notion of leaving the big brand, the Morgan Stanley name? What a lot of advisors say is my clients are my clients. They trust me. They love me. And as long as they know that I have their best interests at heart, they're willing to follow me anywhere. But when it comes to prospects, I worry that if I give up the Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, UBS, fill in the blank, big name firm on the business card and set up, you know, an unknown name firm, whether that be Hightower or the Bonson Group, how will prospects and clients respond to that? Well, I think it's a legitimate fear, and I don't imagine an advisor and proprietor would be human if they didn't think through it. And yet, I know you know this as obviously one of our industry's most successful recruiters, but the reality is that they are always questions that we have to ask only because we don't know what we will end up knowing, which is that it's in our mind and not their mind, that at the end of the day, I don't really believe that I suffered tremendously from the name brand issue. But if one forced me to pick post financial crisis, if the name brand was a benefit or a curse, it would be more curse than benefit. It wasn't a meaningful curse. It wasn't like I was walking into people all the time who were saying, because of the shenanigans out of 08, I don't want to talk to you. It's a highly personal and relational and individual business, particularly here in America. There was something I had learned. I mentioned earlier that I came out of the UBS acquisition of Payne Weber. And I happened to know that the Swiss guys were just blown away at what would happen when someone left Payne Weber to go to a competitor, how all their clients would follow them because it didn't work that way in Europe. It was more of an institutional relationship and an institutionally minded culture. And I think that the individualism that's unique in American life has caused a big difference in even wirehouse defections. Everyone ha- boasts a different story, but for the most part, people believe that they are a client of their advisor, not of their firm. I had a lot of confidence in that, and I knew we were going to have a very high retention rate. I didn't know it was going to be 100%. I didn't know that there were going to be clients adding new money in in the midst of transition because they were so overjoyed at us leaving. But I expected it to be successful. It just happened to be more successful than I anticipated. But I'll tell you what I found out, and I think that this is important for wirehouse people still considering it. Morgan Stanley is a great firm, has a great history. There have been periods of things that I'm sure that they regret as a company and periods of, of you know great achievement and, and sources of pride. But There's another very well-known firm here in our country called J.P. Morgan, and obviously there's a history to where Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan actually had a connectivity back in the 1930s. But I had half a dozen clients ask me in my first few days of leaving if they were at Morgan Stanley or J.P. Morgan, and it was humorous except for it hit me like a ton of bricks. These were people who had been clients at Morgan Stanley for years with me, and they didn't even know the name of the firm. It was so important to them that they were part of Bonson Group and so unimportant to them they were part of the firm that it just simply was a non-event for them to be moving wherever Bonson Group was going to be re-officing and so forth. And I think that that's what is true for most advisors who have stayed close to their clients. And frankly, with prospects, it's the same type of thing. The only difference is you, of course, are not you know getting paid by your prospects. But if you're courting them the right way, you're building trust, you're demonstrating competence, you're demonstrating likability, 
and through time they see themselves as see themselves as being courted by you not by the logo on your business card i would agree with that totally that's been my experience as well for those i've counseled but i think Success in that comes down to being able to convince the client or let the client know, prospect know, that it won't cost them anything, not only in terms of cost, whether it be a tax consequence and having to move a position or additional fees, but also cost in terms of sacrificing platform or technology. And that's one of the biggest questions we get, that Morgan Stanley has recently invested more than a billion dollars in technology. And so one of the questions we get a lot is, how do you as a standalone advisor even think about competing with the technology at Morgan Stanley? So I guess the question is, from a technology and platform perspective, do you feel like you've had to sacrifice anything? Has there been any downside to it? No, and and I can't imagine anybody in my shoes would say anything different, but it is not just simply that I haven't had to sacrifice. Like That would not be my answer. My answer would be that it's been an overwhelming positive, which is different than saying there hasn't been a negative. I don't doubt that they're now saying they're going to spend another billion in technology, and by the time they're done, give it a year or two, and they will need to spend another billion because that battleship turns around a lot slower with 16,000 advisors and a 60,000 employee organization and bureaucracy than it does with an independent firm that is in an open architecture relationship with its technology vendors. So I made a joke earlier about being able to Mr. Potato Head, a strategic partner, take the best parts of each one and so forth. Well, you can literally do that with your technology architecture. So we have been able to pick what we like about a certain CRM and what we like about a trading platform and what we like about a research analytical tool and piece these different things together, very web-driven, app-driven, very mobile, all the necessary cybersecurity components, state-of-the-art, highly um, modernized, where at the wirehouse they put a lot of money into technology But anyone at the wirehouse, I think, would have to testify to the fact that change happens very slowly. And then number two, the tech they're building is to protect them. It's not necessarily to create the most effective experience for the advisor and the client. And so for me, the technology is a huge selling point for independence. I can't believe how more digitally progressive we are as a firm than we were five years ago. And what about does it ever feel or did it ever feel like overwhelming drinking from a fire hose is, you know, how do you sift through then all of the tech providers, platform providers, vendors? Isn't it just easier to have somebody else pick and choose and say, here's what you're going to use? Well, I can see that being kind of overwhelming for a lot of people. There are certain parts of it that were sort of fun for me. On the research side and anything investment related, I really enjoyed it. I liked seeing what some of the different tools and resources and platforms there were out there. And it was a whole new world for me, and I really enjoyed it. But then when you get into some of the other aspects that may not that may be more wonky, that's where a strategic partner can come in, be very effective. And whether it's Hightower or the other competitors out there that have done a similar thing, they've been able to build out subject matter experts in each of these sort of domains from CRM to email marketing and whatnot, all the different aspects of a technology experience that they can kind of do that due diligence and present choice to you. And also even, you know, competitive pricing and other things like that, that matters. So it was not overwhelming. I think as we've grown as a business, I now have department directors that have to take ownership of the technology that fits into their own suite of the business. And so I don't have to be as directly connected to, let's say, the new trading platforms and so forth that my traders have to oversee. We have a director who can oversee that, and and you could go through all the different departments that way. But that initial first step might seem a little overwhelming, but the only reason why it isn't as overwhelming at a wirehouse is mostly because they do a very good job at just making you feel like they've made it all turnkey. But what they what you give up for all of that turnkey simplicity is an awful lot of customization, an awful lot of quality. 
Customization is the key. So when a big firm invests billions in technology, partly they're doing it for their own benefit, but it's certainly not necessarily meant to be custom delivered for you and your practice. And that's the biggest difference. Exactly. Yeah. A couple more questions, David, because this is incredibly fascinating. A lot of advisors worry about the transition process itself. It just feels daunting and overwhelming. And no matter how much they understand that there are so many boots on the ground and so many people or services they can hire to outsource or insource the transition process, how complicated and overwhelming was it? Was it disruptive? What did it feel like to make the move? Well, the number one biggest asset I had in my transition support was my wife because she gave me an incredible amount of support and encouragement and leeway, recognizing the sacrifice it was going to be to go move at the time. It was already a pretty good sized business. And so without that uh, loving encouragement of my own spouse, it would have been (laughs) particularly difficult. There's no point in giving an overly Pollyannish version of, of the transition. It's a lot of work. And yet when it's done, it's done. And that's one thing I felt in this transition, an incredible piece about was I knew I was never going to have to do it again. It was at my business now. I had multi-custodial platform. It was just very satisfying to know that it was done where I think an awful lot of people that have moved from a wire to a wire are really aware that their first move may very well not be their last. So it's a lot of work. I do envy some advisors, Mindy, that are not as OCD as I am because I think they were probably able to just sort of let some of it go to trust their team, to trust some of their transition support to handle things. I'm a bit more of a I daughter and T crosser. And so I probably made it harder on myself than I needed to probably grown a little bit as a leader in that regard over the last five years. But I don't think back to the six weeks it took us to transition our business as six weeks that I miss. I'm grateful that they're done, but we moved a $600 million business in six weeks. And that was an incredible achievement. And we did it with the support of fantastic people, great resources from our strategic partners at Hightower and our custodial partners at Fidelity. So it is something that many, many people have done very successfully. It's a hump to get over, but boy, is the relief ever worth it when it's all done. That's a great answer. One more question. So what about the future of Bonson Group? What are the longer range plans for the business? Any M&A on the horizon? Where do you go from here? We affected our only M&A transaction in company history last year. And ironically, it was an individual that you once recruited out of Merrill Lynch to Hightower. And he ended up being kind of on his own P&L at Hightower and interested in some succession planning. And we partnered up through the Hightower community. It's a great aspect of our relationship at Hightower is there's a very fraternal relationship amongst a lot of the different advisors. We have a close community and And we're, I think, primarily very high quality practitioners. And so there was a small entity in in Connecticut looking to partner with a larger group. And I had no interest or need in going out and proactively pursuing inorganic growth. But this opportunity seemed to make sense for his clients, for his succession planning, and it was strategically complementary to our business. So we funded the deal ourselves. We acquired that business and now have, I think, some tremendous new client relationships and a tremendous new advisor who is, at least until his retirement, an employee of the Bonson Group. I don't have anybody in my company who's out looking for those opportunities, but should they fall in our lap or should something just organically unfold that makes sense, we're now very open to using our balance sheet and our capabilities to do accretive growth. Yeah, well, and I think that happens to be the smartest way to look at it, that you're not looking to grow for growth's sake, but if the right opportunity comes along, whether you're looking at it or not, you'll always keep an open mind, and I think that's very smart. David, it sounds like you've built a hell of a business, and you're only getting started. It's incredibly exciting. I'm honored that you've shared the story with me, and we look forward to hearing more from you. 
Well, Mindy, thanks so much for having me on, and thanks for all the work you're doing with this podcast. I never miss one, and and I really appreciate all the support you give to our industry. Thank you. David's story is the ultimate breakaway tale. The freedom, flexibility, and control that independence has afforded his business has certainly translated into extraordinary success and actually provides a template for how best to navigate a crisis and manage a thriving advisory practice regardless of market conditions. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908-879-1002 and these days by cell at 973-476-8578 or always by email, mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. A special thanks to advisorhub.com for sharing this podcast with your viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.